We have a great panel here to talk about the what I think is really the key issue in the state of Indiana, which is education and, and the relationship between education and workforce development. Clearly, this has always been the case, but I think it's uh, fair to say that in recent legislative sessions and in anticipation of the one coming up, uh, this has been and will continue to be the focus uh, for the governor, for the <laughs> legislature, and for those of us who work in agencies who are concerned about education in the workforce. And that certainly includes, as well, an extension of that employers. Um, sometimes it, it's called frequently the skills gap that we talk about, this mismatch between uh, the jobs that we have and the training and the education preparation that people have for those jobs. Um, and clearly, uh, education is about meeting multiple needs. It's about increasing personal prosperity and well-being for Hoosiers. I usually talk about that first. Uh, because I think it really does uh, speak to the heart and soul of what we're trying to do, give people better opportunities for more meaningful careers and lives. But as an extension of that, it also is about meeting the needs of employers and those communities in which employers are residing and people live. And then by doing those two, really increasing and strengthening the economy of the state of Indiana. And we need to do all of those, and it's really through the topic that we're going to talk about today that we can do that. I know, because I know many of you in the audience, and I hope the rest of you know that Indiana has adopted the big goal, and that is that 60% of Hoosiers would have a quality degree or credential by 2025. It's not just a number, it is a number that is directly tied to the needs of the workforce. And that means that we need to make sure that where we are right now, which is uh, at about 42%, uh, that we actually have a sense of urgency to get to where we need to be. I, I do want to share the good news, and the good news is that we have made significant improvement. In 2008, uh, that number was around 33%. Part of the improvement has come because we're actually doing better with the population under the age of 44. Uh, but part of it is also that we didn't use to count quality certificates. It was just associate degrees and bachelor's degrees. And now we include quality certificates as well. And we've seen in Indiana a significant increase in certificates as they are aligned to the workforce needs. And we're going to talk a little bit about this today. Having said that, we have far too many people who have a high school diploma or less or some college but no, no certificate that allows them to really move into a uh, meet the need of employer and have a significant career. We've focused on this population recently with two significant campaigns. You Can Go Back, which was focused on those people who have some college but no degree. We've always talked about that as it being about 750,000 Hoosiers. We're now at about 710,000, so we're actually making some improvement. Part of it is people are aging out who didn't have a, a high level of education. But, but more importantly, we're making improvements with the younger population. Um, so I think as we look at that to try to figure out how we had reached the adult population, we're going to talk about both preparation in K-12 and then obviously what's happening in higher ed as well. Recently, we've been working with the Workforce Ready Grant and Next Level Jobs to actually look at people who perhaps don't have any certificate at all and are not able to actually enter into a, a meaningful job. And I think we have impressive numbers for both. You can go back and Next Level Jobs, Workforce Ready Grant that we're going to share with you today, but this is not a one and done. This is keeping our eyes focused. Uh, increasingly, uh, our workforce and education efforts have been really about identifying high demand, high paying jobs, removing affordability as an obstacle, and building partnerships with employers and among agencies. It's, um, it's, it's really not about K-12, it's not about higher ed, it's not about workforce, it's about all of those things, and we have to do it all. Um, and of course, we must do this to align with the needs of employers today, but we must also have an eye to the future as we prepare Hoosiers for what is a dynamic and very changing economy. So with that, as a few words of introduction, let's turn to our panelists, um, who are really among the key people who are bringing, uh, making this happen in the state of Indiana. Joining us today are Secretary of Career Connections and Talent, Blair Milo, to my immediate left. Um, then we have the Director of PK through 16 for the Department of Education, Amanda McCammon, um, President of Ivy Tech Community College, Sue Elsperman, uh, Chair of the House Education uh, Subcommittee, Higher Education Subcommittee, Representative Holly Sullivan, and Senator Eric Bassler, uh, Chairman of the K-12 Funding Subcommittee. Let's begin with Secretary Milo. 
Um, Governor Holcomb has committed to and has been actively engaged in workforce issues during his tenure as governor, addressing the needs of employers and the economy by really focusing on skilling up the workforce. Earlier this year, he named you as the Secretary of Career Connections and Talent, and he recently announced his legislative agenda, which has a clear focus on workforce preparation. Can you share with us a little bit about your early months in this job as you focus on one of his key five pillars, which is strengthening our workforce? Absolutely, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you to uh, everyone for joining us this morning and for our hosts for having us. It's exciting to uh, be here talking about a, a subject that I'm extremely passionate about that, uh, as you mentioned, it's been just a, a few short months that I've had the opportunity to be on the job here. Uh, and, and just by way of background, some of the uh, reasoning behind, uh, I think, creating the position and my excitement for stepping into it in, from a position that I, I certainly uh, loved being able to do and, and serve the people of uh, Laporte as mayor previously, but as we saw uh, the constraints around opportunity for community growth, particularly as we were uh, part of the momentum that Indiana has really done a, a fantastic job creating of uh, developing new job opportunities and uh, business growth, that the challenge we had was slotting people into these new opportunities and, and getting people connected up with uh, being a part of a pipeline or closing some of the gaps that exist in uh, some of our workforce areas. And uh, over the past few months, it's been fantastic to be able to work with uh, the team before you here and uh, talk about how we are addressing the, the challenge where we see around 92,000 uh, vacancies across the state of Indiana in jobs right now. And so we, we know that this gap exists, and then uh, as a part of that process of trying to think through where we should be going, how we should align ourselves to not only close those gaps, but think about how we were, we're getting ahead of where issues may exist in the future, we know that a, a student that is in kindergarten now, uh, when they're going to be entering the workforce, that around 60% of the jobs that they'll be taking don't yet exist. And that helps convey the dynamic nature of work and uh, the challenge that is before us, that it's a constantly moving target of how we should be uh, preparing students and connecting adults with opportunities. And so uh, to, to try and address some of these pipeline areas, then uh, we've really worked very hard on developing an alignment plan uh, with all the different agencies and stakeholders across the state to develop a system that will be dynamic to, and, and nimble to address the changes that we know will come due to the, the nature, the changing nature of work. Uh, over the next few years. And that's really uh, allowing for regional, local entities to have a lot more opportunity to think strategically and be supported in some of the outcomes that they want to generate uh, to create opportunity, uh, not only just locally, but preparing students for being competitive in a global marketplace. And that's the, the driving force behind uh, the creation of the Governor's Education and Career uh, Pathways Cabinet of having alignment amongst all of the different, uh, not only state agencies, but working with stakeholders across the, the state uh, to develop more of that uh, capability and capacity for uh, creating outcomes at a local or regional level. Uh, and so there is a, a, a process to uh, organize at the state level with the Governor's uh, Education and Career Pathways Cabinet made up of uh, myself, the Superintendent of Public Instruction, uh, Commissioner for Higher Education, the Commissioner for Workforce Development, and the Director of Management and Budget to provide a framework to assist local or regional entities to develop talent outcomes uh, that will be tailored to fit the needs for uh, those areas and then be able to adjust as we see changes coming down the pipeline for the nature of, of work in that area and also equipping uh, individuals with skills to be competitive in a global marketplace. Uh, we, that's, that's looking at the system alignment overall, but then also making sure that we are addressing some of the current gap areas and trying to uh, 
uh, provide access to resources, uh, bridge some of the communication gaps that may have existed by uh, aligning more of the entities of which there are a significant number of, of really talented, really passionate people working in uh, different spaces to, to support programs that are closing gaps and connecting individuals up with opportunities. Uh, you mentioned a couple of the tools that we have, uh, some of the newer ones too being uh, with Next Level Jobs and uh, numbers absolutely, as you've mentioned, have been extremely impressive that uh, if you haven't heard about Next Level Jobs, there's two different components of uh, the Workforce Ready Grant where an individual is able to receive 100% uh, tuition for completion of a certificate in a high demand, high wage area through Ivy Tech or Vincennes University. And we've seen uh, 243,000 people come to nextlevelejobs.org, which is the website uh, that hosts the application process for that Workforce Ready grant, as well as the second component of Next Level Jobs, which is an employer training grant uh, that offers employers up to $2,500 uh, of training money for a new hire that will stay on for at least six months and capped at $25,000 per employer. Right now, we've had now 324 uh, employer applications. That was the update as the start of this week. Uh, and then to just follow up on those, those numbers with the Individual Workforce Ready Grant, uh, we've had just about 12,000 applications, completed applications through uh, nextlevelejobs.org of people who are pursuing a, a high wage, high demand certificate. Uh, and then we'll wa walk them through a process of hopefully then being able to complete that and then slot into one of those high wage, high demand jobs. So it's exciting to be a, a part of all of those efforts that are addressing uh, initial needs while also looking at the overall system design that will be able to be flexible and, and nimble to address the changing nature of work. Thank you. I, I just mentioned a couple other numbers for the, um, you can go back, that's focused on students who can, uh, adults who can go back to any place and finish their degree in the, in the public sector and receive financial aid if they have need. We've had about 13,000 who have been contacted and re-enrolled through that and then the numbers that uh, Blair has talked about for um, next level jobs as well. So. You know, these are significant numbers, but they're nowhere close to what we need. So we need to make sure. The thing that keeps me awake at night and makes me worry the most about this, and I think that President Elsperman would probably join me in this, is how do we take this interest that people have and really convert it to doing what they need to do, which, make the, which is making the effort to come back. And we need all of us to work together on doing that. Um, so we talked a lot about career preparation, and obviously it starts in uh, at the early ages, and it's uh, much easier when we have people thinking about what they want to do when they've had some opportunity to explore careers when they're in the K-12 sector as well. Amanda, I know we've talked a lot with the legislature in recent years, made changes with career and technical education. We're doing more with career exploration at that level. Um, if you would share a few of your thoughts about that, and then also um, as the superintendent's legislative agenda is I impactful about the workforce issues, anything in particular that she is going to be talking about in the upcoming session? Sure. Well, thank you first, uh, Commissioner, for allowing me to be here and share in this conversation and continue the collaboration with other agencies across the state. Uh, very, very important work, and we're happy to be here. Um, so to start with, the, um, some of the pieces that are moving already within the department, the impact career exploration uh, goes back to last session with Senate Enrolled Act 198. We have a career exploration pilot that we'll be launching in January. It's called ICE, or Indiana Career Explorer. And that is with a specific cohort of 15 schools for eighth grade students. And they'll be utilizing that tool which has Indiana data embedded into it, which is really that relevant piece. Um, so that's one of the big things that has been moving from the last session, um, but that work will roll out this January. Additionally, as many people probably know, the grad panel made a recommendation to the state board uh, just last week that was passed, and that's significant because there's a variety of things that will have to shift because of that. Um, one would be the capacity of our, of our schools to offer those pieces. Um, there are some concerns with, which we heard from a lot of, our, of the, the stakeholders out in the field, about some of those concerns with rural access, access to work-based learning, uh, qual high quality CT programs, et cetera. So there's some work to be done yet in that area. 
but we have some great things already moving in that area as well out in the field. So some of the considerations with that would be um, potentially, you know, what does that look like for accountability um, in regard to ECAs versus SAT, ACT, et cetera, as it relates to that grad pathway recommendation. Additionally, how do you provide that high quality work-based learning experience for some of our rural communities? Um, by no means is Dr. McCormick and or the department opposed to workforce development. We support it. And many of her initiatives that she's outlined recently um, also align directly to the governor's as well as specifically to workforce development. Whether you're talking about STEM education at the K PK-8 level um, and then leading that into more of a career pathway focused area with CTE as they move from elementary into the secondary level. So there's a variety of pieces. It's a very complex, as you mentioned, a complex um, area because there's many things to consider. Um, not just how do we fill the jobs of today for our high school students as they leave high school to go on to either a post-secondary institution in preparation for a career or they go directly out into the career and workforce, but also how do we prepare our elementary students for the jobs of tomorrow and our middle school students for the jobs of tomorrow. So it's not just about filling the immediate workforce needs, but it's also about adapting their learning at an earlier level to involve creative problem solvers, to create a, um, a sense of urgency within that workforce development need, but also to develop the skills that they may need 10, 15, 20 years out. So there's a variety of pieces already occurring. Another one would be the STEM framework development. Um, we are working with a STEM council and Jen Watts, which is an assistant director of policy at the department, is facilitating that work to bring together stakeholders from business and industry, as well as post-secondary department of workforce development and the governor's office to talk about what that STEM framework would look like for the state, uh, as far as instructional resources, as well as talent development and um, infrastructure. So as we develop that, that's really gonna provide those earlier students, those younger students with those skills to reach those jobs and fill the needs that we don't even know exist yet. Thank you. Um, I think it's really important we talk about, you know, people having some sort of a quality degree or credential beyond high school, but we obviously know there are people who will graduate from high school and go straight into the world of work, and we need to make sure that they have some sort of an industry certification or something that gets them started mm -hmm. along the way. And so I think as we redesign CTE and we look at people having industry certifications, it's going to be critically important that they align with the needs of the workforce Absolutely. as well. Thank so Absolutely. thank you. Um, let, let's turn to President Elsberman. And, we know, as we've heard from Amanda, that it's going to be really important that we have people who are prepared for college or career when they leave high school. And we know that at Ivy Tech, we've seen a significant decrease in the number of students who need remediation because of your redesign of how you provide remediation through what we call the co-requisite yep. model, which has been very successful. Um, and we're identifying students earlier when they're in high school, so we hopefully will take care of that in high school and they won't need remediation. Even if all that's successful, and it's still a lot of work, we have, obviously, as we've talked about earlier, lots of adults who need to come back and get the skills for the 21st century. And Ivy Tech is really uniquely positioned to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted, if you would speak just a little bit to Ivy Tech's obvious and growing commitment to adults, um, how to better meet the needs of employers. I know you're doing a lot in this area. Uh, you know, sometimes in the past we've heard, you know, employers think this, higher education thinks this, and there's this big divide between the two, and we're, you know, trying to do a better job to bridge that. But what can we do to get more people to come back, to complete what they started, or to get, get themselves on the way to a meaningful job? Thank you, Teresa. And I <laughs> affirm 100% what you've said, and I thank K-12 for the, the heavy lift that you're doing, and we're a partner with you on that with the traditional high school students in our dual credit, CTE, and, and we're there with you. But to Teresa's point, yes, we cannot, as a state, achieve the big goal without getting adults to come back. And that's a reality. We can't just look at the 18-year-olds coming out and say, if they just all went to college, they all just did a four-year degree or two-year degree, or were perfectly workforce aligned, we'd be there. We wouldn't. It's not enough. So that adult worker is really critical. And we've worked very hard at that. But I'm going to start with two years ago when the Senate and the House, Senate Enrolled Act 301, two years ago, really looked at Ivy Tech and said, you must be workforce aligned. You have to be aligned with the needs of employers. And given the job I had had for four years earlier, I got to see that firsthand, how employers told us we were not doing, we didn't have all the right programs, 
uh, and weren't delivering the numbers they needed. So uh, in the room is Chris Lowry. He can stand up if you, I can embarrass him. <laughs> Chris Lowry, based on Senate Enrolled Act 301, required us to have parallel to the provost, you know, your, your chief academic officer in a higher ed is a, is a provost, that we would have a workforce VP. So Chris Lowry is senior vice president of workforce alignment for Ivy Tech, very purposefully, and we have spent the last 18 months truly getting alignment with, and we know now what are those high wage, high demand jobs by every campus we have across the state and in what numbers all of those jobs aligned to getting to that 60% goal. So we call it right program, right place, right size. We have four quadrants. We know which quadrants we're not, we don't meet the demand. We know which quadrants we have too many, too much supply for what the jobs are out there. And we know where our equilibrium is. So we've really, got, I think we're the first, I would bet <clears throat> that we are the first college in the nation to be able to say at a campus level how we're meeting workforce demand, our ability. Now, getting there and filling all the right seats in every program on every campus across the state to meet every employer's needs, that's our five-year goal, is to be aligned fully. So that leads me to um, what we're doing in terms of adults. We've just had our State Board of Trustees adopt our strategic plan for the next five years going forward. And the first four goals perfectly align. They all do, but the first four are the most critical. Student success, <clears throat> helping our first goal is, of course, making sure that students come in. Teresa mentioned things like our co-requisite model, making sure that we're a great place, that we're taking a student where they are and helping them be successful in those gateway courses that they have in moving through a program. But there's so much more. The students we serve across the state, think about the typical adult that comes to us in their late 20s, 30s. Uh, they're often married or single parent, working full time, children, so you and typically lower income. So having things like wraparound services that support that student when they're with us to be able to succeed, those aren't things that community college typically were doing or able to do. So it is our first strategy in our strategic plan. It was the thing that our Student Government Association wrote their paper and their request of us as a college last year. But there are all the things that help a student, that, uh, and primarily adult student, two-thirds of our students are part-time, are that more adult, and how do we serve them well. So I want to speak that that is first and foremost making sure. That also means structured schedules. It means we have a, a new effort to move to eight-week classes. Uh, we've had some, but we're now, you see in our strategic plan, a goal to be predominantly eight-week, which for the adult learner is a much better way. And they see progress every eight weeks along the way, in addition to competency-based programs that allow them to move at the, that pace. All of those changes are underway for them. Goal two is the enrollment, recruitment and enrollment goal. Yes, we will continue to encourage every high schooler student to come to us, and we are the predominant. More high schoolers will start at Ivy Tech than any other uh, institution in the state. However, the adults are a whole area we have to be very uh, deliberate and diligent at attracting, and it's different. Uh, so we are so thankful for Next Level Jobs and for You Can Go Back, because both of those really help raise to adults that the possibility of a good job is out there for me, and there are ways to do that. Those four and five flame jobs, we have to get that out, and we have to help them know how they can come back. So adult recruiters, uh, figuring how to work and partner with. We have a great program called Achieve Your Degree with our employers. Uh, we have well over 100, approaching 200 employers, who they, um, they work with us to identify their own employees who they'd like to skill up. Guess what, the best retention tool is to skill up your own employees so they stay with you and take on key jobs. Uh, Cook Medical is poster child for this. Uh, two years ago, they had 50, uh, 50 of their students, their employees that were going back to school on traditional tuition reimbursement, which thankfully many employers have. However, 50 was not going to do the trick. 
they shifted the model in our Achieve Your Degree so that as the employer, they pay up front for the student to come back. They identify which programs they want to offer. Uh, that's often IT, business, some of our STEM fields as well that they want their employees to go in, and then we concierge <coughs> come on site to sign up those students. They are now at approaching 1,000 students, uh, their employees who are now students at, at either the high school level or the post-secondary level. Amazing program. So we're looking to grow that. We, As I said, we have uh, approaching 200 employers today. We think that will be thousands of employees, students coming back to get uh, post-secondary. So that's on the enrollment front in addition to next level and you can go back. But then it's all about completions. It's making sure that our students can complete. We're holding ourselves, in fact our big goal, uh, when you talk big goals, is 50,000 degrees or credentials a year coming out of Ivy Tech for our students to be prepared in those high wage, high demand, workforce aligned jobs. We're at 21,000, so you can imagine my faculty and staff take a big deep breath, go, oh, how are we gonna get there? Well, the way we'll get there is that big goal is not just degrees and uh, certifications, it's also industry certificates, right? It's the industry certification, I should say. The, the certificates and the industry certifications, we don't even count those today. They're embedded in many of the programs we do we need to make sure that we're getting those because particularly in areas like technology, those industry certifications are as important, if not more important, than the degree or credential. And we need to make sure we're doing all three, counting all three and supporting our students to get exactly what they need, be it an <coughs> associate or onto a transfer to a bachelor's or the shorter term certificate or certification. So completions are really our focus and then finally, Placement. So our fourth goal is workforce. Or it's the workforce placement piece. We're, one of our metrics is going to be wages. How much better are our students doing when they get out? And how aligned? The second part, wage is one, and the other part is, are they in one of those high demand fields that we've identified? So how aligned are we? So we're actually measuring both of those uh, going forward. Each is a heavy lift, but as you can, will see from the partners up here and across the state, Teresa, I'm very confident that we as a college will get there. And I always tell my team when they take that deep breath, can we get to 50,000 degrees or credentials? Number one, if we don't get there, Indiana doesn't get there. Mm -hmm. You as employers won't have the workers you need. So we have to get there. Now, if we end five years from now at 49,500, okay, we made a huge step. So I believe in stretch goals, in going for the North Star, but we can get there and Indiana needs us to get there to have the prosperity that Hoosiers want and our employers need. Well, the goals are ambitious, but they are doable. They are. And, and I think it really reflects the kind of partnership we're talking here. We've talked a lot about the identification of high demand jobs and, and high need areas. And you know, uh, we obviously have all partnered with the Department of Workforce Development and making sure they actually are the ones who actually provide the information to us so that when we, can, when we look at the, what those high demand jobs are, we are informed by the work that the Department of Workforce Development does with a new methodology they have, which is a one to five flames. And we've actually were able to say if it's a four or five flame, we know that it's a high demand. So this is, this is an effort of all of us working together to do that. And um, it's been really important, the contribution that Department of Workforce Development has made in that regard and going forward. And we look forward to working with the new commissioner when he joins. I think maybe he's joining uh, this, this week. week. Is that right? Yes. Um, <laughs> Yes, and, and what we've, Gina's been doing the work and, and is, continues, did the work before and is going to do a lot of the work after, so it's a great partnership there as well. Um, so let's, let's turn to our two members of the legislature who are here, starting with uh, Representative Sullivan. It's clear that the legislature has been a full partner with the governor um, in advocating for policies to improve education and workforce. Um, and you've been very engaged with that. We've had the opportunity to work with you. You've come to commission meetings. You've been involved with some of the national organizations now in workforce and have really been a voice for this. Um, what 
policies or laws do you see being um, effect, especially effective in improving personal prosperity and meeting employers' needs? And should we expect to see anything new in the upcoming legislative session in this regard? Thank you. Um, with, with my role of representing Southwest Indiana and um, being on Ways and Means and getting to work with the Commission with my role in higher ed, um, I come um, really after listening to everybody here as a snapshot of um, the big goals that we have for the state of Indiana and the reasons that we have those goals, I have to also step back and think there's 49 other states that would like to have this type of problem <laughs> and these kind of resources and this kind of teamwork in tackling something like this. So we are, even though it sounds very big and daunting, um, there are some very great things and the reasons in which we got to this point in the state of Indiana to be able to be working on such a big um, issue for our state. But I think also, um, this is not an R or a D um, problem. This is a Hoosier uh, need uh, for the state of Indiana. So that is a good thing um, for the 150 um, legislators that we can work together um, with all the different um, voices that are represented here on the stage as well. But policy-wise, I think our focus, um, we definitely leadership and um, all those in our caucus in the House especially are absolutely behind the governor and his initiative of helping um, take Indiana to the next level and solving these issues for those companies and those employers that have already invested in Indiana and those thinking of moving to Indiana. And looking at policies that do that, um, we have to kind of take a step back and look at what we currently have. And that's what we did last year when we um, continued the conversation and tried to engage um, agencies to realize that we've got 30 plus programs in this already at the government level, nine different agencies involved, billion dollars out of our budget. And how is that best utilized? Um, are we using taxpayer money the correct way to um, invest in those um, employers and in the state? to retain and grow those skilled um, labor and, and workforce that we need. So I think this session you'll see more of a push to um, bolster what you've already heard out of the executive branch and wanting that, but also maybe to be um, pushing a little harder to see if we can align some of those programs, put that silo of monies that has kind of been spread pretty thin, and we're hearing from employers that those programs may or may not be exactly what they need. So I guess when you said what keeps you up at night um, as a representative on ways and means, what I worry about the most is how can we best listen to the employers that have currently already invested in our state and how can we get out of their way? Because there wasn't a piece of legislation really that was passed to, uh, for Cook Medical to do what they're doing. But there are ways in which we can come up alongside them and increase their effective um, work in their regions um, and partnering with um, Ivy Techs and Vincent's and um, K through 12 and the wraparound services in there. So you'll see policy initiatives come out of probably both chambers and <coughs> different pieces of legislation um, that really push towards looking at how do we put that money into better use as we try to listen to our employers that are here and not forget that we still need to be that um, arm of bringing more business in. And that sounds daunting and it sounds a little scary to those that are um, currently working on this and those big numbers that Blair just shared of the gap that we currently have with skilled forces um, that aren't there for the employers that are currently here that doesn't mean that we stop um, trying to get others to invest and bring in talent from other states. We've talked a long time in the state of Indiana about the brain drain. We do a great job uh, at the university level in the state of Indiana, but then sometimes we lose what we just invested in in the Hoosier state. So we want to make sure at the legislator, legislative level as well that we don't see a pendulum effect and not um, continuing to invest in those universities and in those degrees that we've seen so important, but also turning that focus to how do we continue to work on the brain drain, how do we continue to 
to raise up um, those Hoosiers in our universities and in uh, two-year associate uh, degrees as well, but also at the same time continue the momentum around the programs in which all of you have just talked about as well. So you'll see a policy initiative of really looking at what we have in the agencies and um, how do we push and be a little bit more aggressive because you have representatives that go back to their districts and um, not one district is immune to this mm -hmm. issue. We need to do it all. And you're right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's interesting because the employers are so much more engaged in these discussions yes. than in the past. And, um, you know, we clearly know through Gallup surveys and others that there is a disconnect sometimes between what employers believe they need in the jobs and how we think we're preparing. But if you do uh, survey employers, clearly critical thinking, communications, many of the skills that you get from the liberal arts will clearly be stressed by them as well. And really effective employees often have a way to integrate the technical applied with the liberal arts academic as you think about the jobs of the future. So, you know, we don't have the luxury of only focusing on one part of this. It's K-12, it's adults, it's higher ed, it's workforce, it's, you know, all of us kind of working right. together to address these needs. And so, a 10-week session. Pardon? And it's only a 10-week session. It's a very <laughs> short <laughs> session. So, to be realistic. <laughs> go, it goes fast. And we heard the other day there, only, there may only be like two committee meetings for some right. of the committees exactly. that are meeting. So, exactly. Um, and, and some of these issues obviously are budget yeah. issues as well, so we are preparing for that. Um, Senator Bassler, uh, among the issues that the governor uh, highlighted in his uh, recent discussion about the next session was really a focus on STEM preparation, both K-12 and if you look at higher ed, you know, we look at what we've called in the past high impact degrees in our performance funding. We are shifting that terminology to STEM and looking very specifically at, at high impact degrees through, through STEM. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering what you and your colleagues um, can do to ensure that Hoosiers have a, a better understanding of this dynamic economy that they need to be prepared for and how our laws and policies can prepare people and help to meet the skills gap, but also have an eye to the need for future workforce needs. Yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk about that. I think that um, to, to maybe just go back to the very recent past and look at what we did last session, and then I'll talk about maybe some things we could work on this coming session. But, but one thing that we did with, with, I think it was Senate bill, I think it was 198, um, and, and one of my colleagues up here referred to this, is we, we took the CE, t, CTE categories from, from nine different categories down to three. And, and we wanted to, in some ways, kind of keep it very basic and, and somewhat simple, so we divided them into kind of a high value category, a moderate value category, and then a, a lesser value category. And as you might guess, we, we based funding for uh, each credit hour. Uh, for the high values, we're, we're, we're providing more funding than the moderate, and for the moderate value, we're providing more funding for the low value. Um, that was one part of the, the, the bill. Another one had to do with the Workforce Ready Grant um, that I'm sure that Sue is familiar mm -hmm. with and, yep, and Vincent the University. Level. It's for adults to go back to, to finish, again, a high value a certification program or a two-year degree. Or, um, um, and, and we think that's going to help address a small part of this problem is, again, getting the adults to tool up, if you will, or skill up to, to, to the jobs of the future. Um, other, other things that it did, and I think Amanda maybe mentioned this, is that's the pilot program for the Career Explorer. Um, and one thing that was interesting about that is, it's my understanding this is really a kind of a first in the nation program that we put in place, or at least we're starting to put in place. The, you start talking with, with eighth graders about possible career opportunities. Um, and, and based upon what their, their aptitude is and what their uh, interests are, uh, that they can then kind of help them map a, a course of, of action. What classes should they be taking in high school? Uh, what, what type of a certification program would they need after high school or a two-year degree or a four-year degree? Uh, but then the, the next thing that it actually does is it ties into local information. So if they go that route, what opportunities are there for them? What, what, what jobs are available in their, maybe in their community or in their part of Indiana, their area of Indiana? Um, and, and, and then it also ties in what salaries are they looking at? And so it can, it can help a child, and obviously that child is going to need the help of a parent, a guardian, a, a counselor, what have you, start mapping a kind of a career plan a little bit earlier than what we're doing at this time. And we think that's going to be a, a, a very important tool to use going forward. Uh, and then finally, um, 
we're trying to get um, the, the, what we put the State Board of Education more involved with CTE programs with kind of the data that's available through DWD. Um, so that's kind of what we did in, in the recent past. Now, as far as going forward, obviously we're going to want to work closely with, with Blair and the governor on, on some of the ideas that they're putting forward. Um, but from a statutory perspective, there's a few things that I think we could take a look at. One has to do with maybe some, some piloting with respect to the regional and, and the local talent development systems. Um, there's also an opportunity for uh, some framework around apprenticeships uh, and, and other work-related learning. Um, and then finally, um, a big area I think has to do with STEM. We keep talking about STEM. We've been hearing about that for a number of years. And I think we're going to continue to hear about that. We're going to take a look at uh, two things there. One would be uh, requiring um, uh, STEM-type classes uh, in the K-12 process. Uh, and then finally, uh, with respect to licensure for, for teachers, uh, we'd sure like to, to make it an easier process for people who, who are experts or who have real life experience in that area of STEM to be able to transition over and, and to be a, a K-12 teacher, for example, uh, and bring their, their, their life skills into the, the education environment to provide a better, well-rounded education for, for young people. Um, so those are just a, kind of a few of the things that we've, we've done just this past session and some things we're looking forward to this next session. And then I guess the bottom line is, is um, as the governor continues to kind of roll out and talk about uh, the, the direction he'd like to head um, uh, with, with DWD, uh, with CTE, with the whole area of workforce development, uh, we sure want to work closely with, with him and with Blair as we continue to move in that direction because it's, there's a... There's a lot of work to be done. I mean, we've, we've got some good momentum, uh, but boy, we've got a long way to go too. So we're looking forward to working together on those. So all of this work really is about um, making sure that people have the opportunity to live a meaningful life and have you know, meaningful careers. And um, so as we approach um, this session, um, I guess and I'm just offering this to anyone can kind of answer, uh, you know, what, what concerns you most about the current and future workforce and what can we do collectively to sort of bridge the divides? We haven't talked specifically about the Economic Development Corporation, but what do we do to, you know, grow current businesses and what do we do to attract businesses to Indiana? Uh, and then to how do we match all of these needs? So is there anything at this point in time that we should be doing that we're not doing or that we need to step up our efforts on to actually align the training and the education with current businesses or businesses that might move here? I'll be happy to, to jump in on that one, particularly as you're looking at uh, long-term sustainable talent attraction and uh, where I see uh, IEDC has done a great job in partnership with a lot of uh, local economic development organizations as well of really capturing the the quality of life that is being developed in our communities and the the really dynamic opportunities that are available in uh, a whole host of different areas that are attracting people to come and be a part of the opportunity in Indiana in a variety of different ways and so it's been great to see how there's been initiatives at both the state level and seeing uh, individual efforts to develop more of those uh, unique components in communities that are attracting uh, younger families to want to come and be a part of the, the opportunities there to then be able to, to grow up and, and develop more uh, talent pipelines and connect up with existing opportunities there. Uh, so it's, it's great to see that. I know that uh, AIM or Accelerate Indians Municipalities has uh, really done uh, an effort of showcasing all of the really uh, exciting, kind of unique and intricate things that are happening in our communities as a way of telling the story of the great opportunity that exists in Indiana that is is quite diverse and not always what uh, people would anticipate with uh, the opportunity available here uh, so we're doing a better job of being able to to share those pieces and uh, hopefully as as we look across the the landscape and in, in sort of when you talk about terminology with this one that 
uh, I, I think applies but is often utilized in, in political campaigns that you talk about name ID, then when people look, think of uh, Indiana that we're trying to grow name ID for people to associate uh, opportunity that exists in Indiana and how uh, that's, that's really attractive and uh, that it, a lot of times they just don't have an opinion about what may be happening when, in what uh, has existed here so that then we're growing that name ID and uh, in connection with that the, the really unique things and, and leading in a whole array of different areas in our communities and with the collaboration and partnership at a state level as well. We have a, we've had a big panel, so we knew we didn't have a lot of time for questions. I think someone may be standing up here with a question to ask. I did want to mention, um, uh, Representative S uh, Sullivan mentioned something about this wasn't an R&D issue, and we, we were hoping that we might be able to have Representative Gooden here with us, but he was not able to be here with us today. But I think it is very important that we talk about these issues across party lines, because it's, uh, at the end of the day, getting a good job isn't an R&D job. Um, right. I think we have a question. We're opening for questions. I thought maybe you were there for questions. We only have a few minutes, so if there is a question, if not, we will go ahead and take advantage of this opportunity to talk among ourselves. Uh, any questions in the audience? Yes. Steve Everly, uh, County Commissioner in a very rural county, uh, just west of Purdue up there, Warren County. But uh, I would suggest careful analysis in terms of the tiered rate structure on the CTE programming because albeit that initially you want every student to start very, very strong, when you look at the areas and fields such as cosmetology, culinary, oftentimes those become vital lifesavers for uh, single moms. Uh, those with limited transportation, those with uh, very precarious work schedules and daycare schedules. And so I would suggest that focusing on careers uh, remains incredibly important, and I in no way intend to dim diminish uh, the STEM focus. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, if I can just add to Steve's comment, it, we've used the term high value. Yes, we like high wage, high demand is critical, but there is a high value type of job in every community. And we realize across the state as we have 19 campuses, they're not the same list in every area, service areas, we call them now, not regions, but those around those communities. And we do not when it, we, we at least, you can be assured, aren't putting a broad brush that all are the same statewide because they really do differ. If you're in Northwest Indiana, or if you're in Southwest, or if you're in French Lick, or if you're, you know, you've got different areas. So it, it's wise words. Um, I think that terminology, a job, a better job, a career, we certainly want, and we own, making sure that we make those careers stackable to that notion that they may start in culinary, then they may get a bachelor's degree in business, and they may have, they may be the na next St. Elmo's out there, right? So we've, we want to create in all ways the ability for that student at whatever point in their life to continue on uh, and get the next, the next thing that allows them to be successful. So your point's well taken. One of the things that we try to do is provide better information to mm -hmm. students and families when they're making decisions about what they do. So, uh, you know, we don't track people into a particular job, but we let them know, right. you know, what the, what the income level might be, what their debt might be that they would have in order to get that, how long it might take to, to pay it off, will they get a job, what would those jobs look like and how would they pay and then it's up to the individual to make those uh, choices but it, I think we have an obligation to provide good information to them about what those choices might mean when they right, actually right. exercise them. And I think that's what I hear from constituents a lot is um, how can I have better access to that type of information to help <laughs> my child and my family and my community members make decisions before they're um, in uh, a degree program. Getting that information to our constituents is something that we can align and do together. 
Any, any final thoughts from anyone on the panel? I think we just have a, a couple more minutes. Anything you really wanted to say and you didn't get a chance to with the questions that were asked? I, I guess I would just maybe like to um, go back to a, a comment that you made very early on, Teresa, when you, uh, I think maybe at one time we talked about maybe 60% of Hoosiers mm -hmm. having a degree. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the fact that we've, we've, we've now expanded that beyond just a degree, the term degree, because it seems, I've only been involved with this process for three years since I've been in the Senate, but as I go out and I talk to people in, in my district and in other parts of the states for that matter, um, it, it seems like maybe for, for a significant period of time, maybe too long, the focus was four-year degree, four-year degree, four-year degree. But I think probably all of us know, and, and I imagine most people that are listening know, that people can go on and have successful, have successful careers, provide for their families, provide for their own living uh, with certain types of certification programs. So I appreciate the fact that that, that we've expanded beyond just the term degree, but to, to include certification programs. So thanks for using that uh, terminology. We need it all. <laughs> and, I, and I think if I can just build on that, it's to say we still do, I think we still know part of the challenge is how do we get that word out yeah, right. to parents, to students, to counselors, to community mm -hmm. leaders, to help, to help, to your point, uh, Representative Sullivan, that that our young people and adults make the best choices, informed choices, and not just the assumptions of the last generation that said, right. Right. if you just go to college, you'll be, it'll all be good. It's, it's a little more eloquent of a, of a <coughs> statement than that. It is pursue those things mm -hmm. that have high value, sure. and that can be any of those steps along the way. Well, I think this panel has been a great way to tee up the governor who will be joining us soon. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about this and other important issues as well. So please join me in thanking the members of our panel. Thank you.